This is, uh, I've been on the board for seven years and I want to tell you the MFA show is my favorite time of the year. I'm sad that we can't all be together at Fort Mason, but in some way, this is going to be really interesting for all of us to be able to meet every student and see your work and this hear you more important you'll be able to see. So um, here oh, to you. act as master of ceremonies is yes, John Mariola. John, take it away. It should be very interesting. Hey, Welcome. First off, let me ask everyone to mute yourself if you wouldn't mind. Take a Are moment. Find that microphone. Are muted? No, you're not muted. You're not muted. <laughs> Find that microphone in the lower left corner and click it. Thank you so, so much. I think that works. I'll remind you again if I keep hearing you. But okay, welcome everybody. <laughs> okay, still think you need to mute yourselves if you can, please. You can find that button on the lower left corner. It's a little microphone, vintage looking. You should have the power to mute everyone. <laughs> well, the, the thing is the, the host won't know who that is, but thank you for that option. Anyway, let me start again. Welcome everybody. I'm excited to have been asked to moderate this event. And as in the non-pandemic ages, what is about to happen here takes place in person, in front of the work, installed in all its glorious, physical, audible and experiential form. A rite of passage as one completes their tenure as a master of fine art. This is to honor the blood, sweat and tears these people have shed to get here. No matter what the looming circumstances might be, SFAI has always gotten it right with pedagogy. You're about to see evidence of this in these bright artists showing you their work. Some have created their own language, their own realm, pushing, subverting, embracing. All have achieved so much beyond their well-earned degrees. So let's celebrate them now and congratulate them. So first I wanna do a little bit of housekeeping points if you don't mind. Um, here's the structure, basically. Each presenter is gonna have three minutes. We can take one question right after each presenter. Then at the halfway point, we'll have a, break, a discussion break. So that's about seven people through. Um, and then we can take comments and questions at that time. To ask a question, you can either type it into the chat window or you can type into the chat window that you have a question. So, you keep that in mind. Um, if, you, if you type a question in, make sure you note who the artist is for the, for the question. Um, also, please stay muted unless you're asking a question. Um, and if you could keep your comments um, kind of brief, keep your questions kind of brief. We, as, as Pam said, we wanna hear from everybody. Um, also, Please don't take screenshots or record this in any way unless you have previously gotten permission from the artist. That would be very helpful. Um, and we'll do our best to make sure you get your questions asked. We'll make sure you're, you get unmuted if you need help with doing that. But thanks for bearing with us on the housekeeping points. So without further ado, I want to introduce the first presenter. Probably and, just uh, move up above the spool. Okay, someone please sure. mute yourself if you can. Mute, everybody mute yourself except Song Chi Lu, who's our first presenter. Hi, I'm Song Chi Lu. I'm gonna share my screen now. Okay, I believe I'm here. Yes. So, um, Yes. Wait. Um. Hello, everyone. My name is Sanchi Liu. I'm an interdisciplinary artist. My work is my response to the way so much of the contemporary world is constructed and monitor, uh, constructed by monitors and cameras. The first work I want to show you is a video called The Electronic Moon. I thought about the historical debate of the question, what is on the other side of the moon? A scientific question over since objective, but it's also political. In today's digital world, what is our moon and how do we know the truth of its backside? Here is an expert.
The network satellite is documentation of a live performance. Last year, I thought about how much I rely on a GPS system that is monitored by the government and owned by a tech company. I make a long pole and mount a camera on top. I walk around the city of San Francisco with it. The last work is called String Suite. It is a performance the viewer could experience both in person and live streaming online. I wore a green screen around San Francisco doing normal daily activities. The camera was pointing to the figure and live streaming for 30 hours. The life of the figure is both exposed and hidden. In this work, I thought about how many people die for their privacy in reality and how many people also want more exposure in the virtual world. Thank you all and bless you. Thank you so much. Um, does anyone want to ask a question now? Very good, you can save your questions uh, at, during the break. So thank you again so much. The next presenter we have, Eleanor Schnarr. Uh, <clears throat> Hello everyone. Um, I have a pre-recorded video that I'm going to share with you. Can everyone hear? No. The sound is not playing, Eleanor. Now can you hear it? Yes. 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 My name is Eleanor Schnarr. And this video that you are watching is titled The Son of Heaven. The imagery which you are seeing was drawn from a series of paintings which I am calling Spears. These paintings are made with oil paint on paper, a material which allows them to emulate the luminosity and linearity stained glass in the cathedral in my hometown of Bernathan, Pennsylvania. I have animated them so that they move both upwards and downwards, providing a sense of both motion and stillness. The video was created to be projected on a building or behind a band at a live show, on trees, or on the front facade of Fort Mason. These psychedelic renderings of inner space are designed for interoception, contemplation, meditation, and psychic journeys into the land beyond dreams. These are faithful renderings of the inside of my own brain, wheels of cosmic energy echoed through the syntax of the body. The circular format is one which denies the supremacy of gravity, and it is therefore cosmic, endless, perfect in its infinite imperfection. 
This work exists to illuminate the cathedral of cyberspace. It therefore illustrates the spirituality which is democratic, a-spatio-temporal, accessible, and radically human. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Eleanor. Is there any, thank you so much. Are there any questions for Eleanor? One question for Eleanor at this time. Um, I have not heard of the Zebler and Conti experience, but it sounds fascinating. Um, and I'm definitely gonna Google it right now. <laughs> Very good. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you, Eleanor. But thank you so much, Sid. Um, unless I'm not seeing somebody that has a question. Nope, no questions in chat, we're moving right on. All right, thanks everyone. Um, our next presenter is Luis Flores. Hi everyone, my name is Luis Flores and I'm going to share my screen right now. Um, uh, shoot. Um, I don't think I ever, ever shared my screen before, so it's going to take me a little while. Okay, Luis, make sure you have your file open yeah. that you're ready to share. And then the share button is on the very bottom, that green highlighted button. Yeah, I, I do have it, uh, but it seems that uh, my internet connection is, says it's unstable, which is not true. Okay. <laughs> uh all right so i think i did it oh here we go okay so my work is called mexico 68 or mexico 68 and so mexico 68 is a piece of work that i've created in order to commemorate the lost lives the lost lives of hundreds of students during the massacre in Mexico City prior to the Olympics in 1968. My work talks about the suffering, anguish, death, and later the desolation uh, left behind after the massacre. The debris, the shattered glass of the buildings surrounding the square where the meeting took place, that it took hundreds and hundreds of lives, countless of lives, the palette of colors varies, ochres, browns, blacks, and reds in conjunction with lines that cross and makes a myriad of geometrical shapes, providing the canvas with a powerful visual message to those who know the story behind the imagery. The official logo of the 1968 Olympic Games Mexico 68 is pasted on top of the canvas. In Mexico, the Olympics are seen or symbolizes the oppression ruled by the government on the students, diminishing their demands and ultimately killing them. Historically, the Olympic Games are seen as a promoter of peace between nations. For Mexico was a perfect excuse for repression that ironically helped two black American, uh, two black American male athletes to raise their fists, seeking justice against systemic racism in the US. The canvas provides a very powerful voice to those who remain alive and seek for justice. And that will be my work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luis. I know there's comments that this work is very important and they're happy you're sharing it. Um, Christina, do you wanna ask him a question? Well, more than a question, I just wanted to uh, say thank you for this work. I did recognize not only the logo, but um, the text as, as very much in line with what happened on that time in Mexico. And then um, this logo with the concentric lines that, that reads Mexico 86. I mean, it, it, I did understand what it was about. And so I, I, I felt a connection immediately to it. So thank you, Luis, for bringing it forward and sharing. Thank well, you, thank you for um, telling me this. It's very important. Um, I know that I'm doing something that it was um, something that happened, and it was actually even before my time. Uh, but um, it really um, 
took me a really long time to process this information and, and also I wanted to provide this information um, in a, in a, on visual terms for in what it means, even for me. Uh, like I said, I wasn't born back in 1968, so I didn't know, but, um, but it just took me so much um, time and I just wanted to talk about it. I think it's a very important piece uh, that the world needs to know and what happened to us um, and what the Olympics really mean to us <laughs> in a sense. Thank you. Luis, what's the scale of this? Briefly, that's the question that came in. Um, it was, uh, it was five, seven by 12. Thank so you it was very pretty much. big. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank okay, you. there can be, thank you. There can be more questions for Luis at the break and anyone else. So thank you again. Um, our next presenter will be Shara Mays. Good evening, everyone. And I, your share might override Luis, but Luis, if you can hit the red button on top, stop share, that would be great. Uh, it says uh, pause share. Oh, there, there you go. go. All right. <laughs> yeah. Very Thank good. You. Thank you. Sarah. Shara, I'm sorry. Good evening. So there are three questions that consume my work. What are the conditions of contemporary life which shapes one's identity? What physical spaces, whether real or even imagined, welcome or threaten a person of color? And then how does one overcome the generational trauma of systemic racist policies? This clip that you're watching is from my piece titled Seconds at the Beach. And it was a reaction to the murder of Philando Castile, a 32 year old black American man who was fatally shot um, by police during a traffic stop in Minnesota in 2016. My practice also concerns itself with not just social, but also the kind of psychological construct and false narrative of race and identity in our society. I use a lot of symbols and motifs. Uh, play, they play a really large role in my work. Um, the piece on the left titled Censoring Myself with Fig Leaves, it was actually inspired by the Fig Leaf Campaign, um, which used leaves to censor nudity in art. And my goal with symbols like that is to just evolve them into a deeper, more contemporary significance. And the piece on the right is titled Self-Portrait as a Fallen Unicorn. And it was not only inspired by um, German visual artist Rebecca Horn, but also by homelessness, the homelessness crisis here in the Bay. I mean, how much magic and potential do we casually walk by or even drive by every day? This piece is from my series called Heads of Wonderment, and it's um, known as Willie. I call it Willie, named after my grandfather. He was a house painter, and he painted houses in Princeville, North Carolina, which is um, actually a community established by freed slaves in 1865. It's still a small town, and I was born there. Um, he lived during a time when not only public spaces were segregated, but also the expectation of a life was specifically defined by the false narrative of race. On the far right, I'm wearing this, head, this piece as a headdress as an homage to him. The piece that you see here, the two pieces are from my series called The Burdens. And I made um, the sculpture first. It's made out of my dad's old vintage leather jacket. Um, so I made that first and then I painted it as a contemplation on his life. It's called Dad's Painted Burden, Dad's Burden Painted. And my dad, he struggled with alcoholism and drug abuse. And I, I, uh, that sort of fluttering between mental health and mental illness is like an important prompt in a lot of my work. And this last installation view is what I'm currently working on. It um, sort of represents me taking a more narrative approach to my work um, and also combining multiple pa panels to create a more complex and deeper story. 
this piece here tackles the physical space of a museum. Thank you. Thank you, Shara. Anyone want to ask a question of Shara right now? I mean, you're seeing the comments, right? Stunning, well done, okay. So at the break, we'll dig into that. Thank okay, you, thank you thanks, thanks very much, Shara. So next presenter, we have Lex. Thank you, Lex. Anybody have a question? I dare you. <laughs> um, I got text to my phone, Lex. People are loving it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, next up we have, am I going too fast though? Did somebody want to say something? Oh, Lex for president, I got that. Okay, um, next we have Zheng Ming Zhao, also known as Jasmine. Uh, hi, I'm going to share my screen. Meng Zhao Zhang Suzhou, China, is an artist who works in a variety of media. 
by examining the ambiguity and origination via retakes and variations. Zhang makes work that deals with the documentation of events and the question of how they can be presented. The work tries to express this with the help of physics and technology, but not by telling a story or creating a metaphor. Her works are an investigation into representations of seemingly concrete ages and situations as well as depictions and ideas that can only be realized in art. By choosing mainly formal solutions, she tries to increase the dynamic between audience and author by objectifying emotions and investigating the duality that develops through different interpretations. With a conceptual approach, she tries to develop forms that do not follow logical criteria, but are based only on subjective associations and formal parallels which incite the viewer to make new personal associations. Her works question the conditions of appearance of an image in the context of contemporary visual culture in which images, representations, and ideas normally function. She creates situations in which everyday objects are altered or detached from their natural function with the use of appropriated materials which are borrowed from a day-to-day -day context. She tries to approach a wide scale of subjects in a multi-layered way, likes to involve the viewer in a way that is sometimes physical and believes in the idea of function following form in a work. Multi-layered images arise in which the fragility and instability of our seemingly certain reality are questioned. Meng Zhao currently lives and works in San Francisco. AI generated by http colon slash slash five o o letters dot org slash form underscore fifteen dot php Thank you, Jasmine. <laughs> uh, I hope you're seeing that chat because I can't even represent it. What's going on? <laughs> it's amazing how people are figuring work out. Love it. Um, okay, everybody. So we are at our break time right now. And uh, thank you, Nikki, so much. You brought my attention to a question that went by super fast. Um, it was for Shara. And if we could start with that and then ask questions at any time um, following this. But this is the question. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't know what's from, but it was only for a moment. But what was the white line? slash rope question mark over the figure on the right in the large painting with the woman looking at a painting and a guard in front of it. Wish I could have yeah. seen that one more. Yeah, so that's the painting I'm working on. You can actually see it in my background and um, it's loosely based on an Alfred Bierstadt painting that's uh, hanging right now in the Young Museum. Uh, the painting um, is called California Spring. It was made in 1875, 1865. And I am the figure in the front and I have a rope as a accessory dangling around me. Um, to the right is a security guard who's also African-American. And then I sort of modify the California spring painting a little. There's some strange fruit, if you all know that term, hanging from the tree. Thank you. So who would like to ask a question? Do, can people unmute themselves to ask? Do we know that? They can. Very good. Um, who would like to ask a question? Well, well I'll go. This, I find this incredibly intimidating. So hats off to all of you for 
presenting in this way. But uh, Sid's work, I just wondered about the, uh, it just sort of, um, so prescient about the moment that we're living in. I just wondered how, how that is playing with her, the, the body suits and the, the PPE. I would say, um, yeah, so I started making that um, in June of last year. So that was pre-COVID before there was any inkling of that. And I would say as far as the current situations, like I'm still processing and absorbing all that. Like I don't know yet. <laughs> I don't know. If that question was from the artist Gay Outlaw, just in case you know. And I, I, I can't see everybody's face here, y'all, but if I can see you and I know who asked it, I will announce it. If you don't, announce yourself, okay? I know it's intimidating, but this is our world, right? Um, <laughs> anyone else want to jump in with a question for any one of our presenters? A comment. Uh, Jasmine, I just want to know um, if you could just share a little bit more about your smile uh, in America piece. I, I'm just curious to know a little bit more about the genesis of the piece and just be just, just kind of like unpack it a little bit more for us how the process, um, yeah, how, how it played out for you when you were making it. Um, so I began seeing a lot of um, smile you're on camera. So, so I first made that piece, which is to um, challenge the camera. But I somehow feel like the aspect, the political aspect of it, it's, it's getting stronger and stronger. So I think can stand on itself as a funhouse mirror, um, um, more politically instead of just a, only about the camera. And also I feel like the, actually in the, the American taxes can be um, replaced, for instance, I want to make, um, I already made the smile you are in SFAI and uh, smile you're in China. And actually, I feel like this is a really um, easy to use piece that I can be changed, the text can be changed. Yes. Thank you. Anyone else want to ask a question now? Um, well, I'll ask a question. I am completely new to this, and I'll just say as a sort of outsider looking in, blown away by the maturity and talent um, that you all have shown here. It's, it's just, it's almost overwhelming to absorb. Uh, I guess my question would be, I am familiar with the Art Institute as, a, as an institution in general and a, and a physical structure. W were your works what you've created, did, did being at the um, at SFAI change the path of your work? Are these works sort of products from that experience or was SFAI more the vessel where you, you made what you were gonna make uh, coming in, if that makes sense? That makes sense, good, hard start, question, good start. question. Oh. Do it, Sarah. I can sort of answer in a little bit. Um, I really wanted to soak in the energy of the, the professors at SFAI. That was my whole goal, was to listen to them and to really, uh, uh, you know, get like that almost like um, apprenticeship from them. And I really feel like my work is completely influenced by them. Like, I feel like I've grown like 10 years um, uh, in terms of maturity for my for my uh, visual practice. I'll let other people speak now. Uh, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, I've been at SFAI since 2016. I finished my BFA there and uh, went through my MFA in exactly the time period when we had uh, when we had studios at Fort Mason. And um, I feel like I'm incredibly privileged to have 
been there at that time and in that time in my life I felt like it was um, a very kind of syncretistic sequence of events and I was looking back at some of the artwork that I did when I first started going there and it was honestly because SFAI has a reputation but it was honestly a lot edgier and a lot angrier and uh, <laughs> and I, I feel like I've, I've mellowed out a lot in this time and uh, that's uh, not what I expected to happen. It's a good question, Jennifer. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, anybody else want to take a stab at it or we can hear another question? It's up to you presenters. Let's take another question if someone has it. Oh, I lost my chat. Hang on. We'll get it back up. Okay. No question in the chat. How, well, uh, I could ask this horrible question, but I have heard that it's actually been a little bit more of a productive of a time. And I don't mean to be disrespectful to how difficult, whoa. Um, who is sharing their screen? <laughs> Maybe we could stop doing that if you don't mind. Um, What's it like not having a studio? That's what I want to hear. Because you know, artists live and work and struggle in all kinds of conditions. How's it been for some of you? Besides horrible. Yeah. Um, I can step in. Um, well, it's hard. Uh, we live in a city that is very um, harsh and unfriendly for uh, not only for artists, but um, I think so many families that they're now with the COVID-19, they're being evicted. Um, we're in a position where um, we just need to make whatever it takes with the little space that we have in our little apartments to create art. And I mean, myself, I cannot... I will never be able to rent a studio. So I need to basically juggle around my teeny tiny apartment to make that happen. And, um, but to be honest, after two years at SFAI, I feel fearless. I know I can do things in my teeny tiny apartment, things that I couldn't do before, honestly. And I think that SFAI provides that courage to artists to continue. Amazing. Thank you, Luis. Thank you. And Howard Oranger has a question for Eleanor. Do you have a non-video, uh, do you have non-video versions of your work? I do, and if you saw the link that I just dropped in the chat, um, you can find them on my website. Do you want to say anything about the difference between the still and the um, time-based work? Um, yeah, it's um, it's interesting because I have played around a lot with different animations and making them spin different ways, but um, the paintings start out as round, so they have an innate kind of um, circular motion to them. And then when you just have them spinning, I noticed that they actually made me a little bit nauseous. But mm -hmm. what I found when you do this thing where you flip, you like make it 50% opaque and then flip it on top of itself so that it's moving both upward and downward at the same time, it gives the impression that it's actually still. So that's not my favorite, my favorite way to, way to look at them. And uh, yeah, check out, check out my website. There's a lot of stuff on there. Okay, thank you, Eleanor. So why don't we move on? Um, we can go into our next set of presenters. Um, everybody ready? Yes. Okay, so our first presenter in the second half is Yan Xiao. Hi, good evening. Um, sorry, I can't share my screen now. You can now. I disabled it momentarily. Oh, cool. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. 
Okay. Good evening. Um, my name is Yan Shao. I was born in China and raised under industrial environment in this rapid development era. And my practice explores the realm of human perception and time sensitivity that has been constructed and reconstructed in Anthropocene Epoch. Through so transforming the unseen past and altered psychological landscape into tangible experiences, on the one hand, we are witnessing the advancement of human societies, um, on the other hand, the consequences of our own doing. In this short presentation, I would like to introduce my recent project about the Southern Sea. Um, these are my documentary photographs of how an ocean was trapped as a lake in its surrounded environment that has been altered by human. The apocalyptic landscape is not in any kind of understanding that our nature should look like. And the water surface has shrinked to an extreme eutrophic situation. The aquatic Animals like barnacles have accumulated on the beaches in an ab abnormal way. Um, then I bring these barnacles back to my studio and photograph them and made an interactive digital monument, the Ascension. Um, this is a self-perpetuating rotating hemisphere that keeps a new environment to the barnacles, representing the eternal circle like samsara. It is a metaphor for the continuous natural circles and the documentations of barnacles represent the actual cost of natural resources, human labor, and living creatures that have been consumed during the dramatic environmental changes. And in this monument, um, you can click and magnify each barnacle and to see uh, every detail of them and how beautiful they are. I want to use this monument to offer a perception that connects the feeling of life, time, space, the earth, and the society. Um, you can find uh, more of my work on my website and also feel free to email me if you are interested uh, in my work. Yeah, thanks for your time. Thank you, Yan. Would anyone like to ask one question now? I see a lot of comments, Yan, so make sure you see the, the chat, watch the chat. Yes, I see. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Um, shall we move on to our next presenter? Yeah? Okay. Our next person is Sequinette. Hello. Cinema always distorts perspective and gender is always performed. As a high femme drag artist who uses film, performance, and installation, I rely on elaborate costuming, makeup, sets, and narratives involving over-the-top tropes of femininity to produce luxurious fantasy on stage and screen. Dreamy, magical worlds are created with DIY strategies and analog special effects, using the elements of artifice not as a mask, but as an exposure of truth, both of my own authenticity and of the harmful gender conforming ideology that historically pervades cinema. My creative practice was born out of the East Village underground and downtown nightclubs and performance spaces in New York City, where I was mentored by East Village artists and drag legends. I consider these artists to be family and my work a direct artistic descendant of this generation. Following in this tradition of underground drag culture and feminist camp, I make experimental cinema in which tactics of glamour, surrealism, and fantasy are acts of resistance that reimagine and celebrate queer femininity.
Thank you. Thank you, Sequinette. Um, I saw a comment from a really amazing artist, Lainey Geyer. Fabulous work. You should check her work out. Any questions right now for Sequinette? Okay, so our next presenter is Laura Pacchini. You're muted, Laura. Whoops. Okay, hi. So I'm Laura Bikini, and I'm unmuted. And the first work that I'm showing is of the drawings that uh, for New York City from the San Francisco Art Institute artists that we did during the height of the COVID surge there. So both Dr. Anthony Fauci and New York Governor Andrew Cuomo um, brought much relief to my fear through their use of the facts and data. And it was important to me to know that there were people that were attending to the pandemic at the time. And it was shown simultaneously at ZAZ Corner in Times Square, as well as at our San Francisco Art Institute Tower. Uh, most of the work that I am doing now is about whistleblowers. So the night before the whistleblower lays awake questioning whether or not to act, my paintings investigate the human psyche. The term whistleblower describes someone who takes a stand and speaks up for the benefit of society, risking personal consequence often disturbing the status quo of power and politics. For me, this is a heroic deed. I examine people who did not elect life in the public eye, but burdened by a truth they cannot bear to keep secret, have the power to change the world forever in service of others, bringing hope in a time of distress for a future. Um, I'm motivated by the humanity and self-sacrifice of whistleblowers, which is derived from various places such as death threats for murder for the greater benefit of society, and from losing the security of one's personal and private life to ensure a path of safety for others. The pool of individuals is vast. However, I, chose, I choose souls from recent history as a means for people living today to identify with the whistleblowers' actions and to consider the impact each of us can have on the human race. The messages that I wish to convey by painting these whistleblowers are a celebration of their courage, leadership, and humanity. The fragments represent the multifaceted psyche of the whistleblower. The various thoughts, times, places, and actions in their lives that culminate into their identity that develops over time. Their need to protect the future offers hope to the collective. For me, these courageous individuals must be portrayed in paint as humankind has done through the ages, expressing and showing off the champions of, of society, great heroes, warriors, and leaders. These people are great spirits among us. The whistleblowers are the protectors of life. So in conclusion, my work intends to express how small individual actions we make often have a domino effect, reaching beyond immediate friends, our family, and ourselves to greater communities. I intend to continue the series reaching to 100 or 1,000, activating people to understand that consequences are dire, and we as humans choose to act for the benefit and well-being of all. Well done, Laura. Thank you. Would anyone like to ask a question now of Laura? Okay, save them up for later. Um, our next presenter then is Ryan Golden Kirkpatrick. Thank you. Here we go.
Hi everyone, thank you for being here. My name is Ryan Golden Kirkpatrick. I am a musician, painter, and sound artist. Before arriving at the San Francisco Art Institute in 2018, I was based in Los Angeles, writing, recording, and touring throughout the United States and Europe. Following the release of my last record in 2015, I took a break from music and began painting, studying the late modernists, abstract expressionists, and minimalists. My abstract geometric paintings on paper range from small watercolors to large scale acrylic works. They are visualizations of emotional and psychic interactions I've experienced, observed, and imagined. They are stories of birth, sexual congress, and death. My whisper paintings don't tell a story, they exist within the viewer's story. The whisper of gold glowing from within textured canvases of grounds of deep blues and bruised purples are signals of hope and psychic intuition. Their presence within the settings is intended to bring spiritual depth to the viewer's daily contemplations. My large-scale geometric graphite drawings on paper and panel are not telling or existing in a story. They are instead like rings on a tree, keeping time outside of the story. As the triangulations expand with every graphite line, reflecting the passage of time, they begin to crystallize three-dimensionally, receding into and growing from the picture's surface. My sound work is both performed and recorded, allowing me the highest degree of abstraction. This work is an amalgamation of my expressions as a songwriter and painter. This work is executed on a hundred year old upright piano and a 1970s Japanese synthesizer. Recent works include Under an Avalanche, a live 40 minute improvisational piano performance of which we've been listening to an excerpt from. And a hecto, a dooming 44 minute electronic improvisational composition with multidisciplinary artist and SFAI professor Cristobal Martinez. My practice as a painter and sound artist inform each other, bringing greater degrees of abstraction into my work. I believe deeply in abstraction and its potential to create insight and inspire new perspectives. You can find more in-depth documentation of my work at ryangoldenkirkpatrick.com or on Instagram at ryangoldenkirkpatrick. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. Fantastic. Does anybody want to ask a question now? Ryan. Okay. All right. Um, we will move on then. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll move on to Jeff Maleth. Jeff, are you muted? Jeff, we can't hear you, Jeff. Ooh, okay. Now we can hear you. 
Start over, man. Sorry, you hear me? Oh, yes. Okay, sorry, I unmuted, here I am, sorry. All good. So you heard the first part, okay. Good evening, my name is Jeff, and I recently received my MFA. I would like to say thank you to SFAI and thank you to John Priola for hosting this event. This presentation consists of two series of work, Benjo 17 Manufacturing and Aggregate. I'll discuss Benjo 17 Manufacturing first. My studies at SFAI inspired me to create a fictitious oligopoly that embodies the dubious values of commercial mega entities. And I named my pet mega corporation Benjo 17 Manufacturing. Benjo 17 Manufacturing exposes the substandard workmanship and contemptible business practices of careless companies, disarming them through dark satire, wry sarcasm, and irony. For example, Benjo 17 Manufacturing's construction division manufactures concrete masonry units, CMUs, which are building blocks for civic structures, bridges, roadways, dams, and skyscrapers. However, with Benjo 17 Manufacturing at the helm, the units are generally substandard and or failing. So I created a subcontractor called Anchor Mend to come in and rehabilitate these units with exoskeletal bracing. Anchor Mend believes these braces are not only functional, but appealing to the public and therefore more valuable than demolishing Benjo 17 Manufacturing's initially substandard work product. This is a subtle reference to Kintsugi, which ornates or glorifies a repaired object as well as a commentary on the option of repairing or discarding manufactured objects. In the year 1812, Thomas Bruce, seventh Earl of Elgin, completed his theft of half of the carved marble facade of the Parthenon. Benjo 17 Manufacturing recognizes this historical opportunity, always on the lookout for a lucrative venture. Benjo 17 Manufacturing appreciates that other societies contain priceless cultural capital ripe for exploitation, and enjoys the monetary rewards of bringing said capital to market. Cultural appropriation indeed. Separate from my conceptual work on the Benjo 17 manufacturing project, my additional work is heavily influenced by my career in building construction and my passion for construction materials. This work showcases larger installation pieces that include natural shapes and materials in close relationship with one another. The material manipulation reflects humankind's impact on and use of nature and natural resources. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Excellent job. Um, any questions for Jeff or Benjo at this time? You got some super fans in here, Jeff. I yeah. see it in the chat. Um, okay, so we will move on then to the last but not least in any way, shape, or form, Eve Werner. Hi there, um, I'm Eve Werner. When the campfire erased the town of Paradise, California in 2018, it destroyed the ecosystem in which I grew up, including this, which is a picture of my former childhood home. Uh-oh, did I just stop? Share, okay. The work I'm presenting today explores the empty spaces left by this event to evoke the tangible consequences of human-caused environmental destruction. I pair materials gathered from within the burn scar with forms and methods that suggest funerary and memorialization practices. Frottage using charcoal from burnt vegetation and homes ash and mud, structures that evoke the ancient ceremonial use of stone in remembrance. They're, these are made from fragments of boulders that splintered under the intense heat from the fire.
I juxtapose delicate natural materials with man-made symbols of hubris that can't protect us. And use the devastation of immobile natural elements to represent what the campfire so clearly affirmed. that the effects of habitat destruction are acutely felt by the most vulnerable among us. Those without the means to move on. All known life forms depend on the precise ecosystems in which they evolved. Through interplay of materiality and absence, I intend to convey the fragility exposed when fine natural balances are disrupted. In sum, my current work reflects on a singular event to explore what is lost when habitats are erased. Thank you so much for your time. I welcome you to contact me or visit my website to learn more about my art practice. Thank you, Eve. Okay, that was, that's the whole list of presenters. And I'd like you all to do this one thing and then we're gonna mute ourselves. Everybody unmute yourself and give them a round of applause, please. This was mind blowing. Yay! Come on! Yay! 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 Come on! Congratulations, you guys. Well done. Incredibly well done. <laughs> it's been, it's fantastic and this platform I hear you guys it's more intimate I get it I get it so thank you Nikki so much you helped me um, and, and go ahead and mute yourselves again if you don't mind <laughs> thank you um, um, get ready to oh am I muted no I'm not uh, I want you to prepare your questions but in the meantime there's a couple questions that slipped by that Nikki brought to my attention. So uh, William Messer had said, I heard about the importance of the instructors. What has been the importance of your fellow students? Someone wanted to wrestle that one down? Come on, Lex. Is it open for anybody? Come on, Eve. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> um, the first day I walked in as a student, one of my fellow students, Mimi Vitetta, told me that it would be a transformational experience. And she was absolutely right. It was. And just by saying that, it was like an invitation to jump in. It meant everything to me. Thanks, Mimi. <laughs> What about your other fellow presenters here? Shara, Leanne? I'll just say a few things. Um, Thank you. I'll never forget Ryan playing his piano at Fort Mason. It was always such an amazing gift to us. Um, and I just feel like I've made some amazing friends. I know that sounds so cheesy. Um, but <laughs> in just true. two short years, I feel like I have these friends that will be in my life forever. So that's, God, that's so cheesy. I'll, I'll mute myself now. <laughs> it's the truth. And who doesn't like cheese? Okay, um, there's I, some. <laughs> can I say? Yes, Laura, one? yes, yes. Um, I wanted to just say thank you firstly to Juliana, because I feel like she was the first person that really got me and got what was going on and was an amazing support system when I showed up and I felt like a fish out of water. Um, and then all of the people that have given me encouragement and given me really good critical feedback um, in a usually kind way. Uh, <laughs> but I am amazed with the colleagues. I feel like being around people of such caliber um, forced me to really push my, pull myself up at the same time. 
specific, Laura. I, look, I know each of you could speak to this, but I want to bring this back to your work. This is an opportunity for you to introduce your work to some people that haven't seen it before. We can do a love fest, at, not at any time, but we can do a love fest later. So there's some questions for Yan. Why did you focus on the barnacles in particular? And I'll just throw them out there for you and then you can think about it. Why did you focus on the barnacles in particular? What is the ideal way of seeing this work? Um, first, firstly, the barnacle, because um, when I went to the Southern Sea for field trips for a week and I was just shocked because no, no such kind of beaches that they're just accumulated of that um, aquatic animals. Because other beaches, there is a natural process. Um, they were grounded to the sand, to small particles. Like there are uh, white beaches, uh, they come from the shells. But no, this kind of beach that you will see um, the shell are intact. They are just stay in the beaches themselves. It's because the dramatic environment change that caused that. and. Because because Southern Sea is a salty lake, so um, it has no income water. It just shrink like um, impossibly fast. So um, that's why I pay attention to the barnacle. I kind of use like I feel so sad about these barnacles. They can um, live for at least ten years, but now they're just die in a second. That's that's what I feel, and for this work because of pandemic, so I make it make it as an online uh, website version. But I do uh, like to make uh, a large uh, projection installation that people can just experience um, in a very immersive way, like in a large uh, space that will um, that will make. Um, make it more like a monument, like a real digital uh, monument, and people can see the details. Thank you for that. And I can, I can see how the subtlety of that work could really benefit from a big space, kind of a, a contradiction. Very good. So the next questions we have are for Laura. Um, will there be more whistleblowers after? Great question and thank you for that. Yes, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I'm learning is in looking at the whistleblowers, it requires a lot of um, educating myself about people, various people in the world. And um, I think right now is a really important time that we're going about that. And right now I've just been diving through all of Maya Angela. I'm on her sixth or seventh um, autobiography. And so yes, there will be more. Um, and my intention, as I said, was to go to 100, if not 1,000. So yeah. keep Thank you. your eyes open. Nice one. Um, and so everyone that's attending, the invitation does have a list of presenters, including their websites and contacts. So uh, you keep asking for it because you've been blown away. It is there in the invitation. You will also be... Um, there'll be a follow-up email, if I understand that right, Nikki, with the same information. So you can rest easy and just absorb all this genius while they're talking to you and it will be, their contacts will come to you in the emails. Um, the, we have a question for Ryan. Um, are you there, Ryan? Yeah? Okay. How, how big are the paintings? Do you make that song in the back? Did you make that song in the background as well? Um, this combo like this is so meditative. Oh, that's, that's, that's great. Um, that's really great to hear. Uh, <clears throat> so the paintings, the large scale acrylic paintings are, um, around 80 inches tall and around 50 inches wide. So they're a bit larger than human scale. The, um, the whisper paintings with the gold leaf are typically around 48 by 60 or 36 by 48. Um, the small watercolors are, um, yeah, I don't know, you know, like six, six inches by nine, six by 10. Um, and to, 
this, this song that you heard uh, was an excerpt from a performance that I did uh, at SFAI. So it was an excerpt from a 40 minute improvisational piano performance that I did. And I, I really, I, like Shara said so kindly, like I loved to play at Fort Mason and it's such a large space that you get such good reverberation and such echo. And so I would typically play later at night, but it was just a really beautiful experience for me to be able to paint and then to sit at the piano and play and then to go back and paint. So I can see how they have the opportunity to inform each other. Um, so for me, they're, they're speaking in somewhat of a, of the same way, um, but they're definitely in conversation with each other. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you. And I noticed too, everyone, that Dewey Crumpler gave you a huge congratulations. He had to attend another um, Zoom call. And I think Christopher Coppola as well had to leave. It's ironic he lost his voice. <laughs> I love him, but wow, that poor dude. Okay, and, and I'm, I'm watching here. Nikki, Nikki I'm, I might be missing some questions, so your help is amazing. But you guys, uh, attendees, feel free to just um, ask a question out loud. Unmute yourself, ask a question directed to the artist. If you can't remember their name, look in the window if you can find them or describe their work. Does anyone want to speak to everyone and ask a question? Um, John, am I muted or not? I hear you. Okay. I just want to say something really quick. It's not a question. And I have to say it quickly or I'll start crying. And that is that, um, yeah, I don't know if I can do this. You can do it. Thank you, John. You know, this is just brilliant. You're doing such an amazing um, job here. And to my students, who I had the tremendous honor and privilege of working with. I just want to say thanks, you guys. And I love seeing you all here. And to all of the students, it's just incredible to see your work. So delighted to at least have encountered you in this limited way. I wish we all were in person seeing the actual work. But given that we can't do that, um, I'm grateful for this. Thanks. Thank you, Lenny. Mm -hmm. Um, I know you touch the students you've worked with. I've heard from them about you. Mm -hmm. um, and Anna Suik wants me to ask Jasmine this question. Do you, th if she thinks of her fashion design background blending with her MFA final project? Asking me? That is for Jasmine. I don't have a... <laughs> I don't have a fashion background. Uh, Anna, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I can ask my question. Sorry. Yeah, thank it, you. Um, no, no, thank you. I'm I meant more from like your um your fashion fa your so fashion forward and so um so edge edgy in in the way you present yourself with um and like how do you feel you're coming together with this project reflects also in your, yeah, reflects in, in your art, like, yeah. I don't know, I'm, really, I'm sorry. I really thought you had a, a, a fashion design background before you came to SPI. And uh, yeah, I was curious to know how you, you think these two things blend together. Uh, I had a international relation undergrad background. <laughs> So, so, but I don't have a fashion design background, but thank you for saying this. Well, you can see that in the work, right, Jasmine? Yeah. That's the language of the work. <laughs> thank you. The work knows more than you. <laughs> <laughs> you're right, you're right. <laughs> um, you, anyone else want to ask a question? Fire it away. Uh, oh, I'm getting the message from the producers. The, t the, the time is up for our questions. I, I see your heads, Anna. Um, is there one last burning question? I hate to end this thing. It's been really, you guys are incredibly, incredibly talented artists. You have made some really powerful work here. Some of it, it, it's, it touches my heart and you can see in the comments uh, how 
important this work has been to these viewers. And do you all know how to save the chat in Zoom? You see that little button over on the lower right corner with the three little dots? Click on it and it says save chat up top. Do that. Go back and read that stuff people have been saying about you. It's, it'll, it warms the little cockles of your heart, I promise. Um, okay, I have to end it. Uh, wait, Nikki sent me something private. We can also send out, no, okay. Uh, all right, I guess I'm gonna have to stop, right? <laughs> we have, okay, jeez Louise. Um, does anyone wanna have the last word besides my little self? Well, this is Pam. I just wanna say, this has been an extraordinary experience. And I think even, even when we're all back together in a physical space and you have a chance to show your work and we get to see it in person, we should do this too. And because it can reach a much broader audience that way. And I think, you know, um, particularly now, this kind of thoughtfulness and intelligence and contemplation and beauty really in so many different ways and so many different media is really, I think people have a real appetite for it now more than ever. So, um, you know, that would be my hope that, you know, moving forward, we do this in addition to a face-to-face -face exhibit. Um, so uh, there's more of this for the audience you all of you are invited back a week from now for another cohort of students and more of this wonderful work so please join us next week again um you know our our goal is to 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 keep on going here um at sfai regardless of what you may have read in the press we are going to be offering degree programs this coming year and our goal is to continue to offer this transformative experience to students for another 150 years. So, um, and uh, you know, we, we will depend on our community to help us do that. So please um, reach out to us if you wanna help make this experience available to future generations of students and um, go to our website, make a donation. Um, every dollar goes into our actually doing what you saw tonight. So thank you thank so much for joining us. And thank you all of the students for your incredible work, the faculty for, you know, your tireless efforts with the students and the relationships you build with them and um, the staff for supporting all of that. Thank you. Thank you, Pam.